um, at seven o'clock. So I think if we can get through this in an hour, we have allotted and then if there's any reason to get back and if we have questions um, and or if we feel like we need a little bit more time with you. I think last year, Chief, we might have done two sessions, but I would also say for me personally, last year was my first year being involved with the police department budget when I came back on FinCom. And of course, Amy was involved with this. But that was my first year too. Oh, it was, okay. And yeah. Well, uh, and this is my first year on the finance committee, but I'm very familiar with police budgets. I'm the chief financial officer in Somerville. I've worked with our police department for 30 years developing police budgets. So I'm very familiar you know, with, with, with what I'm seeing in front of me here. So I just okay. want to let you know that. I might have some basic questions in terms of how Wakefield operates, but uh, I'm pretty conversant in this stuff. And you might notice that Ed's also the most best well-dressed of any of the thing. Well, I'm coming from work and I want to wear my tie it. here for the police yeah, department. Yeah, okay? yeah. <laughs> He'll still have it on at seven o'clock. I'm coming tonight. from work too. He's, he's a show off. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so when I get started, so is there any public participation? Okay, hearing none. So again, I'm, I'm gonna go to my, uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be looking at the actual budget, the, the one that chief that you sent over earlier today. Mm -hmm. And I think, uh, I think, you know, I, I have some specific line item questions, but I think it would be probably useful for you to, um, if this works for you, give us a general overview of the budget. And, you know, um, I think the way we kind of did it last time was we talked about the budget, you know, where there are specific increases, reasons, and then we sort of had a discussion, which was very interesting to me about the uh, general state of affairs, things going on for, so for example, last year, you know, you talked about, um, you know, comes to his town meeting action to, um, to make improvements to the police station. Then we went back to town meeting recently and got the approval for more. You can talk perhaps about the timeline for that. Um, some other, you know, personnel matters that you might feel appropriate last year you know you talked about the recovery coach and the mental illness clinician um I'm, I'm just you know things you know that we've talked about you know covid reimbursements grants you know it was in the paper the other day about getting a grant for um the um body cam re recording devices the cams so stuff like that you know you you have i know you have a little bit of a wish list last year you gave us a really fascinating uh, rundown of what the future might hold, giving all the development that's gonna go on in town or is going on in town in the future. So um, does that work for you? Would, is it, you comfortable with that, following that? Let, let's talk about the money first and then talk about some of the things behind that and then you know some other things that would be interesting to the subcommittee. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. So uh, just touching on the budget, the overall budget first, um, if you look at the percentage increases, you know, the two things that are going to really stick out to you are the personal services, the increase of 5.79%. So let me give you a quick breakdown of where that uh, percentage comes from. So in this budget, we're adding back in our uh, July 4th line item, July, uh, and, and that's $38,000. July 4th line item has been eliminated the last two years, of course, because we didn't have the fireworks or the parade. So that uh, that festivity is, is back on. It's planned again for this coming year. So we had it, we had to add that back in. Uh, and that accounts for a 0.65% increase. Uh, also added in here was $86,854 into the holiday pay line item. So the, uh, the holiday pay account has been underfunded for years. And last year there was an addition of another holiday, uh, Juneteenth, June 19th. So for this current fiscal year that we're in, the holiday account is actually underfunded by $66,808. So uh, that increase is necessary to take care of what's been underfunded, plus the addition of the, uh, the new holiday. Now, so we would, we would isn't the holidays in the in the CBA or are you obligated to fund what's in the is does a collective bargaining agreement list all your holidays that you need to pay out? It does. Yes. And so yeah, and I, I was curious when you say it was underfunded. So that that seemed very strange. That that, that line item just hasn't been uh, increased 
over the last few years. There's a few line items here that even though the, uh, there's a contractual raise, some of the line items don't go up, such as uh, the sick overtime line item, vacation overtime line item. Those have been level funded for a number of years now, even though they have been contractual raises. So the holiday pay is a little bit, it sounds like a little bit of having two dimensions to it. One is the fact that it had been somewhat underfunded and a new holiday for all town employees, right? That's yeah. correct. June 19th. So that, you know, that would be something that we would see in different dimensions across. Obviously you have, you know, it's a larger overall for you because you have a lot of employees. So fire DPW is where we would, you know, probably hear that also, for example. Correct. Okay. And then we have uh, contractual salaries. And I know if you uh, if you look at the individual officers, you'll notice that there's a different different percentage for each officer. And let me uh, get into explaining why you would see that. So contractually, uh, there was a 3.5 percent increase uh, for the officers this year. Other officers, you'll see more. Uh, there's some that received 4.5, and that would be because they hit a uh, a longevity stipend. At 15 years, 20 years, and 25 years, there's a 1% increase. So we have a couple of officers that have hit 15 years and a couple of that have hit 20. I think there's uh, six officers total receiving an additional 1% for longevity pay this year. Does the 1% go in increments of every five years after 15? So if somebody hits 25, do they get another 1%? 15, another 1% at 20. And then another one percent at twenty-five. So it's one percent on the base, whatever the base is. Correct. Right. Uh, if right. the base is Quinn, then it's one percent on the Quinn stuff as well, right? Whatever their overall salary yeah. is. Correct. Okay. All right. So, so just while you're there, um, and maybe you're going to get there, so I apologize if I'm jumping the gun on you, but you know, looking at the um, percentage increases scrolling down through, and just you know, a general comment because. Um, but you look at uh, Lieutenant Anderson, Sergeant Powers, one of my most phenomenal soccer players in my coaching in Wakefield, uh, Officer Smiglitsky, they were all 7%, Damasi, Hembro. Right. Why are, why are there increases? Um, so that, that was where I was going next. Okay, sorry about that. That's fine. So both, uh, I'll start with Lieutenant Anderson and Sergeant Powers. Both of those individuals were promoted back in the summer of 2019. So for supervisory officers, there's a four step uh, pay process. It's four pay increases. Uh, each of those two individuals is hitting their fourth step this coming year. So not only do they get the contractual raise, but they also get a step raise. Right. There's one officer that's going down, it looked like, um, uh, Officer Lyons. Officer Lyons, and the reason for that is he went from the, uh, the night shift to the day shift, so he lost his night differential. And the reason it's, uh, four, what is it, 4.17? Yes. I believe that's because he went uh, from nights to days halfway through this fiscal year. So it's a little bit, it wouldn't be a full 8% savings for next year. So chief, I just so the night differential is that a percentage on base? Correct. And you do weekend differential as well? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So those those things would come and go by individual, obviously, because people would move around in and out of those shifts, right? Everything here is based on seniority. So as a senior yeah. officer retires, yeah. uh, opening comes up on the day shift. The most senior night officer moves up to days, and they lose their night differential pay. So what's an example, like you gave the example of the promotions for Lieutenant and Sergeant, but what about some of the officers that are in the 7%? Is that day, night type stuff? Say that again? Well, there's some officers that are in the 7%. Correct. So let me get down to them. Yeah, like... The first one is Adam Smigielski. Yeah. So yeah. you'll see to the left of his name in N3. Uh, what that means is he's at, he's moving up to night third step. So he's currently at a second step. He'll be moving up to the third step. And the patrol officers have five steps in their pay scale. So he would be moving up to 3.5 for his contractual raise. And then another um, almost 4% for his uh, 
or three percent rather, not four percent for a step raise. So that's the difference between the three point five and the seven point okay. two was the. the so step that would up. that would also be for the other some of the other ones that I I didn't mention them all, but there's some other ones that it I. It would mentioned. include uh, Jeanette Damasi. Yeah. Uh, Adam Hembro. Jeanette's going from a uh, from a night four to her final night five step. Okay. Adam Hembro is hitting his final uh, night five step. So I think there's five officers here, patrol officers that are hitting their final night step. Okay. And then you have some down below, you know, I kind of stopped looking, but you have Mark O'Brien and Robert Peterson and uh, right. Brian Malone all up in the seven. So this yeah. is about steps then. Right. Yeah, those are the younger officers that, or the newer officers on the department, people that have yep. been hired within the last three yeah. years. On the other side, Chief, are, is there anybody eligible to retire, going to hit 65 in the next year or so? Nobody that's going to hit 65. We do have um, one individual that will be eligible to retire February 21st. Um, I ex fully expect that he will retire, maybe not particularly on that day, but probably before the summer hits. Mm -hmm. Um, we have two officers that are out injured right now that I don't expect back. Uh, we've already started the process of trying to replace them. And are they uh, are they permanently disabled? Are they going for a disability retirement or? That's correct. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we we've, we've started the hiring process to replace them already uh, because it is a lengthy process and. Uh, is there, it, the, the academies are hard. Uh, uh, there's been trouble getting folks into academies. Uh, the, uh, the academies lined up to, to get them. Um, we we have two seats reserved in the academy only because we know that there's such a high demand right now. Yeah. Uh, so luckily, we, we, we have a good relationship with the Lowell Police Academy. So when we request that they hold seats, they'll do it for us without actually giving them a name first. Which That's is great. Nice. That's good. Some academies won't do that. Yeah, that's excellent. Yeah. Yeah. So we have, we're in the process of firing two. We'll have to hire another one at some point this year. Um, we have two people that are eligible to retire now. They have the age, they have the time, they have no interest in leaving. They perfectly content continuing to work. So I, I don't expect them to leave. And just for Amy, as I look at my notes from last year, which I am doing, uh, Looks like the overall increase was about 4.3%, and this overall increase is going to be six point six and a half. For uh, for salaries? Uh, no, I have an overall. You know, I'm looking at my notes from last year. Um, the oh, overall increase is 4.3% across the board, and the overall increase for this budget is 6.5. Right. So, which is all all. Oh. There's, there's one substantial increase in the uh, <clears throat> contractual services section of this budget. <clears throat> that, that accounts for a big chunk of the, um, the overall increase in the uh, percentage increase here. So if you look at contractual services, the computer maintenance software line item, last year we had 19,000 in there, and this year it's 69,000. So I, I asked for a $50,000 increase in that because of our uh, body cam program. So we got a grant through the state to purchase body cams. <clears throat> grant is only for equipment. It doesn't cover uh, video storage. So just to give you an idea what video storage costs, uh, myself, the deputy chief and Lieutenant Rebley, over the last couple of years, we've um, We've met with some body cam companies. We've got prices from them. And video storage is the most expensive part of any body cam program. The Absolutely. Itself, they're relatively cheap. They're inexpensive. But it's the uh, the storage that's expensive. And, and the grants don't cover video storage. Right. We leave that up to the cities and towns. So Axon, which is a big name company, it's who we actually use for our tasers. Um, just to give you an idea, in 2020, they they gave us a quote of $58,740 a year for video storage. Um, another company, Body One, gave us a quote of $47,318. And then another third company, WatchGuard, was $31,725. So we haven't actually chosen a vendor yet for our cameras, but I used the figure of $50,000 because it's on the high end and I want to make sure that the money was there for video storage. It's, 
there's a good chance that we'll come in under that and that we'll be able to give some of that money back that we won't use all the $50,000 that I asked for. But that's why you see such a significant increase there. We'll look back at the top of the budget and you see the 27% uh, increase in contractual services. That's where most of that comes from. Uh, there is a small increase in professional services from 87.5 to 89.687. That's the line item that we pay our mental health clinician and our recovery coach from. They were doing a small increase this year, and, and that's why you see that uh, accounted for in that line item. We also those, lost- those, those, those are not town employees though, right? They're not, but we, we pay for them out of our budget. Are they, are they contracted with contracted services? They are. They're through Elliott Community Health. Okay. But they're there at your disposal when you need them. Right? Correct. So the yeah. uh, mental health clinician, she's here in our building full time, 40 hours a week. And then we share the uh, the recovery coach with Stoneham. Mm. We have her for 20 hours and Stoneham has her for 20 hours. Yeah. Well, that's I applaud you for getting that in there. That's that's well needed in these, in these times. Uh, yeah. They, they do incredible work. They save us a lot of work. Um, you know, everything you read about in the news about having uh, mental health response teams and police departments trying to create those teams. We've had it here for a long time and it's. It, and it should be in the police department too. I know there's some thought out there that it, sh you know, it shouldn't be part of the police. So it should, you, it, it, they, it, these clinicians have to be working side by side with the officers. No question. Absolutely. Yeah. So the recovery, coach, the recovery coach is the 20 hour job, right? Correct. Yeah. So then we also, uh, last Chief, year we can, had... I, can, I, can I just interrupt you for a second? So it's just interesting to me, and I don't know why I didn't ask you this before, Ed, I'd be curious your perspective. I'm just, you know, when we talked about contractual services and we're talking about different step increases and things like that, it's just interesting to me that those dollars aren't just part of contract of personal services as opposed to... Uh, no, actually, Bill, under the... Uh... The, 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 the process in, in municipalities, uh, that's considered ordinary maintenance, contractual services, uh, the contractors. Personal services really should- oh, No, 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 not the contractors, not the contractors, right? So none of the dollars that we, okay, okay, I, I, I get it, okay. Yeah, so I, think of personal services, employees, no. employee benefits. Yeah, and, no, I, 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 I misspoke. Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, yeah. So Chief, I, I was just, I'm just kind of curious. Um, uh, the body cams. Yes. Um, how how is the the uh, force going to react to that? Has that been negotiated in, or do you, do you anticipate any difficulty implementing this? So it's interesting you ask that. So as part of the grant process, uh, we were one of two things. We either had to have a body cam policy in place, and if we didn't, I needed a letter from the union stating that they were willing to work um, with me to establish a body cam policy, and we have to have one within six months. So I went to the union, I told them that I was going for this grant, that I wanted to get body cams here. And they said, all right, well, uh, let us have a, a union meeting. They had a union meeting and probably 10 minutes later, I had a letter that says we're all in and we'll work with you on a, on a policy. So, right. um, right. you know, if you would, if you had thrown body, the idea of body cams out there 20 years ago, you would have had people uh, retiring. But nowadays it's, we have a different crowd here. Uh, the officers realize the value in the camera and they want it. So it, it's, it's a good well, thing. It protects the officer as, as, as well as transparency. It protects the officer too. It's, you know, so True, right. more and more uh, officers are uh, looking forward to it. Yeah. They are. They're, they're actually, uh, you know, we have a young crowd here, so they're, they're very tech savvy. So yeah. they're, they're kind of excited about it. Well, that's, that's all good news it really is. Yeah. How long does the video have to be stored for? That'll all be in the policy. Um, so what we're, we're doing now is we've taken a number of policies. We have a policy working group, uh, myself and two representatives from each union. And we're gonna go through a number of policies and kind of dissect them, pick out what we think works best for us because um, some of the policies you'll find they're too restrictive and some aren't restrictive enough. And luckily there's some, uh, this was, it's actually the federal government has what's called a policy wizard. It's something you can actually use to help create your policy. And we're going to use all those tools, put them together and, and come up with a policy that works best for us. 
But the uh, as far as to answer some questions about storage, we're we're looking at cloud storage. So there's two options with storage. You can either go with on-site uh, hard drive storage or cloud storage. I have no desire whatsoever to have uh, servers here storing that information for a number of reasons. Number one, there's liability with it. Number two, too much can go wrong if the servers went down and we didn't know it. We don't have somebody here that can monitor those, service them. Um, you know, I, I'm just fearful that if say we lost video because a server went down and we didn't know it, we'd be accused of playing games, um, purposely eliminating video. I don't want any part of that responsibility. Uh, when you contract with these companies, it's, it's in their cloud storage, they're responsible for it. And they also have redaction software so that when our officers need to make a copy of a, a video for court for a public records request, it's much easier to make redactions in the video with the software that these companies provide. Chief, I'm, I'm not sure if I understood Amy's question to answer. I think her, I think your question not is how long do you have to retain it, it all depends on what the incident is. You know, if it's if it's an arrest, you would retain that video as long as you needed it for the case to be disposed of. Um, if it's a traffic stop, maybe policy says six months. It, it's all different based on what type of incident it is. But, but can you create your own policies around that? Or is these, you know, policies that are mandated or suggested by town council or? We can make our own policy. Um, so what's interesting about what's mandated is that the police reform bill has created a body one camera commission. And by July 30th of this year, they have to come out with their findings, the commission's findings. And part of that may be a uniform policy that has to be adopted by every department in the state. So we may come out with our own policy that says X, Y, and Z, and the state may, this commission may come out with a policy and say, well, it doesn't matter what your policy is, this is your new policy. I would think there would be some standardization around that. And, and they're, most of them are relatively close. There's not huge deviations in, in policies. Mm. Okay. Mm. Thank you for that explanation. I, I can give you one example of something in a policy I don't like. There's one department that has a policy that says that you can only turn your camera on for criminal investigation. Well, a lot of things we deal with that aren't criminal investigations. You know, if we're dealing with somebody who's in a mental health crisis, that's not criminal. But, you know, it's a situation that you certainly may want to have body cam footage of. I assume something could start as a non-criminal action and turn into criminal too, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, There's one other thing here. Uh, two things I wanted to point out in the budget as well. So we also... Last year, we had FEMA CARES and uh, ARPA reimbursement under contractual services for uh, $18,750. Uh, we don't have that money this year, so there's a slight reduction there. What is that again? Can you say that again, Chief? Uh, FEMA CARES and ARPA money reimbursement, basically COVID money. COVID money, yeah. Yeah, you can legitimately use that money. Let's say I was going to ask you a question about how the pandemic was affecting your staffing and overtime, you know, so you use that money for police fire overtime right. um, as long as you tie it to the uh, pandemic, you know, so. We'll be looking at that at the at the end of this fiscal year. Uh, we, we've been hit in the last two months. We got hit pretty hard by COVID up until then we were fine, but it's, it's taken a toll on us in the last two months. So I think at the, uh, the end of this fiscal year, we'll see where we stand with our overtime accounts, and if we have to use some of that ARPA money to offset it, we will. Okay. Chief, back to the recorders for a minute. So you, the grant was for 75? 75,000. 74,712. Oh. How many recorders does that represent? 50. 50. Um, what's the life cycle and, you know, of, you know, do you expect to get out of the recorder? And what happens if one's damaged or something in the incident? That's all, that's all something. So you sign a contract with these companies. It's a five-year contract. And that's something that you, you'll, there'll probably be a warranty included inside that contract that we'll have to pay for. And that will cover any replacement 
these companies want you to have their product so bad. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so if the camera is damaged, they'll replace it. Yeah. There's, there's no, no warranty. competition right no. now. There's no warranty budgeted right now, per se. It'll be worked into the contracts. So basically, that will be, um, we'll use the, the grant money to purchase the equipment, and then there'll be a remainder of a fee, and then it'll be rolled into the, um, how it, it'll be broken up over five years, five years worth of payments. Which will is, is there, have these been around long enough? I mean, at least, will they still be, you know, effective devices, six years, seven years, eight years, or you expect that, you know, I think, I think need, five years is probably the limit on these devices because, you know, technology advances so quickly now. Yeah. Um, but it may, it, it may be some of these companies do it as a lease. Like you purchase it yeah. and yeah. But they upgrade your equipment for you in five years at a reduced cost. But, but this is structured as a buy based on the grant, right? Correct. Yeah. It's all gonna really come up, uh, come down to how they write up the contract. Hmm. But does the grant govern that it's a purchase versus a, a lease? You know? It only covers the cost of equipment is what it said. So that's a great question. Yeah. So I mean, and again, this is, all futuristic, but in the future for replacements, you might decide to do a lease so that you do a refresh and- We may uh, even switch companies. You know, so, you, you just so. don't know, maybe uh, we select a company to, a vendor to deal with and we just, for whatever reason, maybe they go out of business and we don't like them, but we yeah. decide to switch. Just, again, I just want to ask you this while we're on the subject of, you know, obviously it was nice to get that grant and saw that in the item last week and the fire department similarly got, got a grant for some items, but um, do you have any other grants pending? Are you pursuing any other, um, any other grants for any other items? Besides body cams? Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. We, so we have um, multiple grants that we get for traffic safety. Um, it covers anything from uh, safety equipment for roadways like you'll see around town you've probably seen some new flashing signs that say your speed mounted to telephone poles uh, yeah. those with a grant uh, I know Lieutenant Anderson he's a chairman of the traffic advisory committee he just bought some uh, he just bought some new safety equipment through a grant we have enforcement grants that we use for uh, seatbelt enforcement OUI enforcement we just got a grant for a um, in the spring. We're going to do a bicycle rodeo for the kids. And we got grant money to buy helmets to give away to the kids. We get a grant for child safety seats. Uh, Sergeant McCall's in charge of that. I think we got enough money for 50 seats this year. Mm -hmm. And we give those away to parents that, um, you know, those seats are pretty expensive. So anybody who's in need of a new seat will give one away. We have a couple of uh, car seat technicians who are certified to install them. Uh, other grants, we get, a, we get a grant for uh, EMD, which is Emergency Medical Dispatch. Uh, we're contracted through Cataldo Ambulance for that. Uh, that keeps our officers from having to, to be certified in EMD. Because we answered 911, so we're able to transfer the uh, medical aid calls to Cataldo Ambulance. Deputy Calabrese, what am I forgetting here? Do, do you have different oh, last year? Some of them come up that aren't in. Uh, last year, there was like a, a JAG, we call it a JAG grant that usually comes out once a year and you can purchase. So last fiscal year, we got a brand new Tasers and that was about $20,000 um, that we were able to get for that. And that's something that just kind of, it gets, that grant usually gets announced annually. So if we see that come up again, uh, we may be able to purchase some additional equipment. Um, but that's one that we got last year. But it was, you know, it was just a one-time thing. Do you, do you have somebody on your team that's specialized in the process of, you know, writing and seeking grant money? Or how does that work? Yeah. I, 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 that, you know, Bill's asking the question I, I was going to ask because, you know, in Somerville, I've actually got, a, you know, two full-time grant writers that work with the police department. So I was going to ask you if you felt you had enough support in terms of uh, writing grants from the town, because I think uh, 
I'm very surprised that the town doesn't have a full-time sure. grant writer. And I think it's, it, it pays for itself. It's, it's going to bring in money, you know? So um, I'm surprised, you know, and you're doing as much as you are, you know, there's quite a few grants, um, but. Um, we would love a grant writer. Uh, Deputy Calabrese did the JAG grant. Um, I did the body cam grant. Sergeant Haggerty did the uh, road safety grant. Sergeant McCall does. We all do our own grants. We're, we're all doing something different. Yeah. yeah. And I know there's plenty of grants that, that we probably could and should be applying for. It's just a matter of not yeah. knowing about them and not having the time to do them. Yeah, there's plenty of money out there. There really is, you know. So when you, if you have a, a full-time grant writer, they, they can do the research and the resources and, you know, find them. First of all, half the battle is just finding them and then uh, writing them up and, and working with the uh, departments, you know. Well, now that Ed's on the finance committee, he'll be able to... Uh, I'm going to advocate for this, yeah. Well, <laughs> okay. no, he, he can let you know what more grants are possible for police departments. Okay. <laughs> How about that? All yeah. right. Yeah. Deb, Deb Calabrese looked like he had something he wanted to mention there. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just, I, I like what, I like where Ed's going with this. Yeah. Uh, I think, because it, it's not just one department that could use the, you know, several departments could share. And when you start getting into the bigger federal grants, you really need to know the lingo and the wording. Yeah, to, absolutely. It's, it's really a skill. Um, right. and, and there's definitely an art to it. So, um, yeah. You know, in, in years, years past, you know, for Ed and Amy, again, this is my second tour of duty on the finance committee. I know in the years past, the, the subject of grant writing and grant expertise has come up. I can't really recall where, you know, Steve stood on that, to be honest with you, but it, it's not an uncommon topic and, you know, likely to come up uh, in some discussions we have, you know, going, going forward. So interesting stuff. Yeah. Um, just, just back and chief, I, you know, I'd like you to share some, some other things uh, that you talked about last year and you've shared with me about just sort of the future of the department, but just, um, you know, I feel obligated to ask about some of the line items in the budget where, you know, it's level funded for last year, but not much of the money is spent. Uh, other materials and supplies is 13,000 or you know, when, okay, so you went down to, you went down 2000 and I apologize. The, the recommended, that column is with the percentage increase and decreases is not turned on, you know, it all says zero. Right. Um, so I, I, I misspoke on that. Um, like public safety is at 30,000. You've spent not even half of that. I don't, I, you know, what is that? So um, what happens with a lot of these accounts is that, um, I'm pretty careful with them throughout the first half of the year because right around March, April, May, we starting it, we start to get hit with um, service contract costs. So public safety, since you brought that one up, uh, that's the account that we buy all of our ammunition out of. And we probably spend at least $12,000 a year on ammunition every spring to make sure that we have enough for the following year. And then there's some other um, equipment issues that will come up. Any equipment that we need comes out of that public safety fund. Okay. If okay. you wanted to look at some other, uh, name some others if you're interested in other materials and supplies, uh, that got a substantial increase a few years ago because it was decided that that was the account that the equipment for the uh, parking enforcement officers would come from. So we have two handheld devices that the parking enforcement officers use that we, uh, we have a contract with a company called Complice and those devices are leased. So what happens is they're able to do all the parking tickets electronically. Uh, they can scan a license plate, they can scan an inspection sticker. It will tell them uh, whether the car has a parking permit for town or not. They can electronically chalk a tire with it and then it will actually print the ticket. The device will actually print the ticket. The bill for that ranges around $750 a month. So those bills get paid out of that account. Is that headcount in your budget though? Say that again, sir. Is that headcount in your budget? It is. That's a, that's an hour budget. Parking so investment in their, in their supplies come from our budget. So we're, what line item accounts for that those, do you have one person? We have two. So if you go down to page 10, on the budget, um, it's included with the clerical pay. 
Oh, 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 I get it. Okay, I'm sorry. Under Linda Donaldson, this, it shows two part time. So, okay. they actually, we gave them a pay increase this year because they were actually getting paid less than the lowest paid town employee. So we bumped them up to be uh, equal to the next highest, the person getting paid above them, which brought them each up to 23, 564. So they got a slight raise this year. Okay, I, 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 to be honest with you, I, I missed that. I just hadn't scrolled that far to be honest with you. So thank you for that. Okay. All right, th those are all the questions I have on specifically on numbers and obviously we've drifted into other categories. So the, you know, other things you wanna share with us, Chief, and again, I think some of the things that, you know, we've talked about or you share with us about uh, the future of the department, uh, all the development in town, how you look at that impacting, uh, the department in the future, um, dispatchers, uh, you know, you, you talked a little bit about civilian dispatchers. Do you want to share some of your thinking on those things? And of course, I, any other questions that Amy and Ed have? Sure, I'll, talk, I'll talk about staffing first. So when I, I took over the department in 2019 and we were averaging uh, right around 19,000 calls per year at that time. And I know what I talked to the subcommittee then about how we really needed to add some personnel each year to the department. I would love to bring us up to somewhere around the 55 person officer range. Um, we're at 47 or budgeted for 47 now. I certainly wouldn't expect to do that all at once, but if we could, my goal was to, to try and do one officer per year. And the subcommittee uh, was pretty receptive to that. Um, and then of course, COVID hit. Uh, we've been short a detective for six years now, I think uh, we've got, officers, we have officers assigned to the schools. So we need officers in specialty positions. We need our SROs, we need our family services officer. Um, we need detectives, but unfortunately that all takes away from patrol. And the patrol force here is extremely busy. They handle a lot of uh, diverse calls, calls that are very time consuming. Um, there's really nothing simple about police work anymore. Any, any call you go on is somehow complicated and everything requires documentation. So it's not just about the time you spend on the call, it's about the time that you invest in the call. Because you still have to come back to the station and write a report and do follow-up and whatnot. And we talked about the family services office, I mean, the uh, clinician and the recovery coach, a lot of the work that the officers are doing on the street is directly tied to, to them. Yeah. And they, they work together. There's a lot of collaboration there. There's a lot of communication and like I said, everything's time consuming. So uh, the goal really is to get more officers on the street. I talked last year about the, the growing population in town, the number of construction projects that we're seeing. Uh, I rattled off a, a list of projects that we have at the head of the lake, Salem Street, Foundry Street. And I, I estimated at that time, we were looking at about 1,200 additional living units by the end of this year, when all those projects are complete. And when you would start to look at calls for service, there's a significant impact there on calls for service. So we've been working with the same number of people on the street for years. We just keep stretching it thinner and thinner and thinner. And at some point there's a, there's a tipping point where it just doesn't work anymore. We need, we need additional people. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like a double-edged sword too, because now we're in the hiring process of trying to replace two people that we know are, are leaving. And like I explained to uh, Bill, a couple of weeks ago, the number of people applying for this job is declining rapidly. Um, it, it's unbelievable, really. It really is. It, uh, years gone by, you you be, you covered to get on the civil service list to become a police officer. Not it's, so much. It boggles either. my mind, and I, 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 we can't we can't we can't find people now. It's just, no. it's, it's terrible. So this this current list that we have, there was an exam in June, and there were 22 Wakefield residents that took and passed the exam. And when we reach out to civil service to hire, um, that's the list that we're given. And unfortunately, when you start going through that list and you look at people's uh, criminal histories, driving histories, backgrounds, um, it <laughs> the list shrinks real fast. Yep. Yeah. So, as much as I would, I want to add to the department. Now it's a challenge of finding qualified people. Fortunately for us. Um, we have to replace two. We found two people that we believe have 
good character and, and will make good police officers. So in the process of hiring them, how many more of those people we could find in that short list, I'm, I'm not so sure of. So it's really a tough situation uh, as far as looking at the prospect of hiring new police officers. But like I did talk to Bill about is uh, we need to modernize the way we do dispatch. Um, since I've been here and from probably eternity, there's been a, a patrol officer and a, and a supervisor that work dispatch, which is an archaic system. No. Uh, the supervisor, his, his or her role is to be the officer in charge of the, of the shift. And here at WPD, that officer is not only running the shift, but sitting in dispatch chair, answering 911, answering the radio, answering the telephone, when really they should be in a dedicated office, reviewing reports, making sure that work is filled, tending to prisoners, uh, monitoring what's going on out on the street and in the, and in the station. It's a very challenging position and it's very difficult to do when you're in the middle of doing one thing, such as reviewing a report and all of a sudden 911 rings because there's a car accident and your attention is drawn somewhere else for half an hour. So what I'd really like to do is to get a, um, a staff of civilian dispatchers yep. to work the day shift and the evening shift. I, I don't think we need one on, on the midnight shift. I don't think it's busy enough but I'd like to hire at least three full-time civilian dispatchers so that we can put a civilian dispatcher with the police officer in dispatch and have the officer in charge doing what an officer in charge should be doing. And that's running a shift. The other benefits of civilian dispatchers is if you, if you hire them from your civil service list, you pretty much bet them out, you screen them, you get to see whether they're good candidates for, uh, to be a police officer. A lot of departments. And there's mandated training for that too. I think the state state, state training uh, he, mandated. He has a 911, uh, it's like a 911 academy, they call yeah, it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I forget how many weeks it is, but it's really, it's, it's a great way to vet out future police officers. Now, does that mean you're going to have turnover? Sure. But you know what, if we can really get to know somebody and, and see whether they're capable of doing the job, that, that's a help to us. So that's really where I'd like to start is um, before we start adding officers to the department is to really kind of go in the direction of civilian dispatchers. But this budget does not ask for any additional headcount. It does not ask for dispatchers. Not right now. The, um, the station being under construction starting in March, uh, it's, I think it's the end of phase one that they'll be moving downstairs. Uh, I had some conversation with Steve Mayo about it. Uh, he's, he's a supporter of the idea. I know that with some of the ARPA money, we can use that towards uh, paying employees. I'm hoping that maybe if civilian employees is something we jump into in the middle of the fiscal year, we can cover the cost of that with the ARPA money. But that's something that's a conversation I have to have down the line. Yeah, in terms of the ARPA money, um, and this is probably a, a question of Mayo and Steve uh, and Mr. Gill. So I don't know if Wakefield has a quote revenue loss, because if you have a revenue loss with ARPA, you got a lot more flexibility in how you can spend it. And you could you could spend it on exactly what you're talking about, Steve, uh, Chief. Yep. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, and that could be some serious money there for, for um, a whole variety of things. All right. So yeah. I, I have the cost of three full-time dispatchers figured out, uh, including benefits, the 30% that you would include for the benefits, right around 186,000. So you, you really, you're getting uh, three full-time civilian dispatchers for the cost of uh, one and a half police officers and two police officers. All right, you're increasing the productivity of the police force just by doing that. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, and really not just the productivity, but um, really helping us liability-wise, modernizing the system. Yeah. It's really something that should have been done a long time ago. Ed, does does Somerville have civilian dispatchers? Oh yes, absolutely. We've had it for uh, oh god since the nineteen nineties. You know, yes. and um, as I said earlier, there are standards and their training. So, and we actually get grants from the state to train them. So, um, we've got uh, we must have about fifteen of them. Of course, we're you know big community, uh, much bigger than um, Wakefield, but um, yeah, I I. I I, I can't imagine how, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree hundred percent. This should have been done a long time ago. Uh, this is, this is, it is archaic uh, the, the way we're handling it here, you know? So, 
the other the other thing that improves is that we have a lot of young officers in the department so we try to have two sergeants per shift uh, one in the station and one on the road as a patrol supervisor but of course if uh if one of them takes a vacation day or is out sick and it doesn't cause a, an overtime to be hired then um the only supervisor we have is is the sergeant working the desk mm -hmm. situations where really there should be a supervisor on scene about a call, whether it be a domestic violence call or whether it's a, a use of force case, you really need a supervisor on scene. So it would free up the officer in charge to respond to those things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the construction and the timelines and things like that? Sure. So uh, the shovel is supposed to hit the ground on March 21st. And there's four phases for the project. And the first phase uh, is to get the lobby of the public safety building complete to move dispatch from the second floor down to the first floor. Uh, to also have the records office on the, in the lobby and to have the uh, reception area for the fire department uh, finished as well. So that's phase one. At the same time they're working on that, they'll start the construction of the, uh, the front of the building to uh, add the, go out the 17 feet out the front of the, the uh, police station. And that whole product, that part is phased, there's four phases there. Uh, detectives will be displaced. Um, the executive assistant here, Linda, she'll be displaced. Myself, the deputy chief, the two lieutenants. Uh, we're gonna be kind of moving around within the building um, to accommodate the construction. It's, it'll be challenging, but it's something that we think we can do and we'll make it work. And the end goal, I think they're looking at, they say right around a year, uh, based on prior experience when they did the building before they, I know we were, it took a little longer than they expected. So I, I would guess probably like a year and two or three months to be more realistic about it. Mm. It is challenging because we're, we're staying in the building while they're doing the construction. So I, I expect it'll take a little longer. Mm. Okay. And the cost, I know we had to go back to town meeting and ask for more money. And the uh, the problem is COVID. The cost of building supplies went up. The cost of everything went up. And that, unfortunately, wasn't accounted for. It couldn't have been accounted for in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I don't have any more specific questions, Amy or Ed or... You know. Just one more. I, I, and this is uh, replenishing police cruises. That must be a capital item. Correct, that's, Chief. That's a capital item. And how often do they get replenished? Are you, are you satisfied with the schedule? I am. So we, I ask for three cars a year. Mm -hmm. And so this is my third year doing it. Uh, I've got the three cars I've asked for every year. Uh, when COVID hit in 2020, I got knocked down from three to one. That was a little hiccup, but we keep our cars in pretty good shape. So it didn't hurt us too bad. Uh, this year I'll be going for three cars again. And as long as we uh, we have a good system of replacing cars and, and repurposing older cars to make them last longer. Mm -hmm. So our fleet's in good shape. Okay, great. That's good. Capital is typically one of the last budgets that we, you know, that is brought forward or heard. Okay. Yeah. Right. The only other thing I asked for in capital this year is that our radio equipment that was installed uh, back when the building was rehabbed 20 years ago, it's starting to fail. So we've lost some of our intercity uh communications the equipment is old it's outdated it can't be fixed anymore so i uh, i included a request of seventy thousand dollars in my capital uh, to replace some of that radio equipment it's at the end of its usable life okay deputy chief do you have any other you know do you have any comments you want to share or add from where you sit uh no i, I think the uh I think the chief covered pretty much everything. I think we're in, you know, we have a, we have a good budget, we're treated well, but there's, there's uh, you know, there's always some need items there and I think you get on those. So thank you though. I think we lost Bill. Bill frozen. Bill frozen. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Amy, did you have anything? 
I did not have any other questions. We already hit on everything I had I had tagged when I looked at the budget. I, uh, my computer froze up there. Sorry about that. Okay. Well, if we don't have anything else, uh, Amy or Ed, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll second it. I'll second the motion. Okay. So, Chief, Deputy Chief, thank you for your time. And what I'll do is I'll put some minutes together and I'll share them with all of you and would ask that uh, please feel free to, you know, provide any edits. This is something that, you know, I, uh, we were obligated to submit uh, for public record. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll get that out to you within the next couple of days for sure. And I value any feedback you have. So appreciate your time. Very Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thanks. Good night.